Tonight, the anger amidst the ashes on Maui. There's people that wants to go out there to just be nosy. Questions over what did and did not happen as wildfires destroyed lives. And the monumental search ahead for the missing. Allow us locals to get to our families that are still surviving out there. Thousands told to run from wildfires in the Northwest Territories. This is the largest evacuation in its history. It was pitch black, the sky was red. It was insane, it was really scary. And how intensely can you work out while pregnant? I plan to continue biking for as long as I fit on my bike and feel comfortable. Why, well, maybe time to change the advice. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We begin with breaking news and another stunning moment in U.S. history, a fourth indictment for Donald Trump. A grand jury in Georgia voted late tonight to indict the former U.S. president and 18 others, including some of his top allies and aides. They are all accused of a conspiracy to overturn his loss in the 2020 election in Georgia. Among the charges, the very serious racketeering. I am giving the defendants the opportunity to voluntarily surrender no later than noon on Friday, the 25th day of August, 2023. Ashley Burke watching all of this unfold from Washington. So Ashley, this has been a very dramatic night. It has, Adrian, and this is a sweeping indictment that charges Donald Trump and, as you mentioned, 18 other defendants with racketeering, a type of organized crime. The indictment alleges that after Trump lost the election in 2020, the defendants, which include his lawyers, conspired to unlawfully change the result in Georgia. And this comes after a long day full of twists at the courthouse. Security dramatically heightened as police escort a grand jury to court in Georgia. Their tasks decide if Donald Trump will be indicted for the fourth time this year. No, I'm not going to answer any more questions. A series of witnesses called to testify, some a day ahead of schedule. As Democratic District Attorney Fonny Willis moves her more than two year long investigation into the next phase, seeking charges against more than a dozen people, including Donald Trump. What's striking and notable is the possibility of racketeering charges, in effect, arguing that the defendants engaged in a criminal enterprise to commit a few crimes at once. Those alleged crimes tied to the extraordinary lengths Trump and his allies allegedly went to in Georgia to overturn his 2020 election loss. Before the grand jury's vote, a statement appeared on the court's website saying Georgia was set to charge Trump with a series of offenses, but it was quickly pulled down. Trump's lawyers fired back, saying the district attorney's office had once again shown that they have no respect for the integrity of the grand jury process. We love you, Donald! And cast Trump as the victim. We did nothing wrong. Ahead of the hearing, Trump continued to escalate his personal attacks, smearing Willis's name and calling one of her key witnesses, former Lieutenant Governor General Jeff Duncan, a loser. Writing online, he shouldn't testify. I barely know him, but he was right from the beginning of this witch hunt, a nasty disaster. The social media game that, that Donald Trump has played over the years, uh, it's, it's, it's shallow, right? Well, it's not very smart. It's witness tampering pretty blatantly. So, Ashley, what happens now? Well, Adrian, this indictment contains dozens of different charges against Trump and his allies, including Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman. But what ties all of these defendants together are those racketeering charges that we normally see in gang related criminal investigations or to take down mafia bosses. And in Georgia, if Trump is convicted, he could face a minimum of five years in jail. Adrian. All right. Ashley Burke in Washington. Thank you. So is, there has been a sad admission from the governor of Hawaii tonight. The death toll in what's already the deadliest U.S. wildfire in more than a century is expected to grow substantially. So far, at least 99 fatalities have been confirmed, but many more people are still missing, and crews have yet to reach all of the hardest-hit areas. As the search continues, frustration, of course, is mounting, both at how the disaster was handled as the flames moved in and in the days since. Magda Gabrasalasa is in Maui tonight. So Magda, after a slow start, officials it seems say that the speed of that search is now accelerating. 
Yeah, so there are more people that are part of the search. There are more dogs that have been called in as well. And we heard today that about 25% of the disaster area has been searched at this point, but they're continuing to keep people away from that area. Now, there's a lot of frustration uh, among residents of Maui, questions too around when they'll have access to the road into Lahaina. And this morning, there was hope that some of them might be let through. Take a listen. After days of being blocked from going back into Lahaina, a glimmer of hope for some. Oh, I got my, uh, my access to the other side so I can see my burnout apartment and see what's left of it. To get past the roadblocks, permission slips were given to residents, workers and volunteers. But within a few hours, they shut it down again, citing too much demand from non-essential and non-Maui residents. There's people that wants to go out there to just be nosy. Allow us locals to get to our families that are still surviving out there. Allow us locals to get to our kupunas and get them their medication that they need. Another source of frustration, mounting questions around the ongoing response to the wildfire disaster. The New York Times reported firefighters struggled as they were running out of water. The Washington Post points to questions about why the utility company didn't shut down power with hurricane force winds picking up, a known hazard to spark fires. Already, it was revealed that warning sirens were never activated and that power failures and cell outages prevented emergency alerts from getting through. We're heartbroken that people couldn't get out or didn't get alerted. The state governor has already announced there will be a review looking into the response, but stressed the huge challenge of fighting back this force of nature. If you put a fire truck in the way of the flames that were coming through at 1,000 miles an hour, the fire truck would have been incinerated in addition to the people. For now, the search for the missing continues. Officials say it will last for several days, and the number of dead expected to rise dramatically. We have sent more personnel as well as more cadaver dogs to come into the area, and they are working in conjunction with the Maui Fire Department and the Sheriff's Office to make sure that we are doing this in a very methodical way, but one that is also very respectful um, of the community to make sure that we find everybody that is unaccounted for. Magda, we appreciate their developments throughout the evening. What else do we know tonight? Well, it seems at this point that those roadblocks don't, won't be going anywhere anytime soon with crews still having to search so much of the disaster area. But the fact is a lot of people are really frustrated uh, knowing that they're not going to be able to access the road and get to family members that are on the other side uh, in need of supplies. All right, Magda Gibbers-Lass in Maui tonight. Thank you. As residents on Maui try to enter Lahaina, more Canadians are describing their frightening escape. Yvette Bren now with the story of a BC couple that was forced to flee as the flames rapidly approached. It was the vacation of their dreams, a honeymoon to Maui that came to a harrowing end. And we could see in the distance that there was a little bit of smoke. And as we kept driving, the smoke got a lot bigger and it got a lot darker. That's when the wind hits and they're trapped on a highway for several hours with thousands of people trying to escape the flames. The winds shaking the car was really scary. Finally, they got to a hotel trying to find a room, but there were none. The lobby soon filled. A man thanked them for offering his family their couch. One of the gentlemen from the family had walked over to us and he said, you know, we just watched our whole house just go up in flames and we're so fortunate to be here. Their stay was short, forced out to return to their cars, stuck on the highway again, this time for days. These people were offering what they could to us, even though so many people and so many of those people had lost everything mm -hmm. themselves. After another 48 hours of sleepless heat, they got a break, a small window to return to their condo to get their belongings. It's two in the morning. It's pitch black. There's no power. There's no nothing there. And we go up to the, the officer who was at the checkpoint and, you know, explain to him where we were going. And he said to us, go fast, don't stop, and get out of there as fast as you can. They raced through the dark, unaware of the scope of what surrounded them. And it wasn't until the next day that we realized the reason we didn't know where we were is because everything was gone, just, just flattened. That stop, the last before flying home Saturday, their return bringing relief, but it was short-lived. People have lost everything, and it's, it's not a tourist place, you know, right now. Now they're urging other tourists to give Maui space to grieve, 
the overwhelming loss. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. There are some terrifying stories of escape from fire here at home tonight. More than 200 fires are burning in the Northwest Territories, and the ones near Hay River have sent people literally running for their lives. The highway south from the town is now closed because of the extreme danger, and there are reports of multiple buildings burned in and around the hamlet of Enterprise. So with roads closed or impassable, the territory's biggest rescue mission ever is underway tonight. Carolyn Dunn now with the extraordinary efforts to get people to safety. It was pitch black, the sky was red, the traffic was moving slow. It, it, was, it was insane, it was really scary. Holly Bolio, her two kids and a friend fled the wind-fueled flames that were racing towards Hay River. 45 minutes, an hour after we passed that, a, a certain spot, that the fire did jump a road there. Similar terror for the thousands forced to flee two massive out-of-control wildfires. Just embers flying over the top of the vehicles, and you could see 30-foot flames like shooting above the trees, the top of the trees, and the, the spruce trees are all catching fire. With roads closed, the military took over, using Hercules aircraft to airlift stranded residents. With almost 10,000 people under evacuation order, it's the largest rescue effort in the territory's history. The flames they've escaped have done extensive damage to structures too, like in the hamlet of Enterprise. One evacuee snapped this photo of an area gas station, gutted, and the smoke is choking communities as far away as Yellowknife. Another big challenge, phone and internet are out in all the evacuated communities and others in the area. We have a lot of people calling asking for their loved ones who are really concerned about family members or friends who they know are in the territory but they haven't been able to reach, reach on the phone in a couple of days because the phone lines are down. It's the second time this year some of these same people have had to evacuate due to raging wildfires. We've broken heat records in many communities this summer. Um, we're, uh, rain is something we were all praying for and we've seen very little of it. So I do think that uh, this may be uh, things that we need to be prepared for in, in future years. A worrying look into the future for people just trying to cope with the present. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And in British Columbia, extreme heat is also fueling concerns for more wildfires. Crews know this could be a rough week as parts of the province expect temperatures as high as 39 degrees. So officials are asking people to do whatever they can to stay cool. Have a cool face cloth, uh, put on a, a damp shirt that helps your body uh, get rid of some of the heat that you're storing. Several cities in BC have opened up dedicated cooling centers while advocates are calling on municipalities to consider setting a maximum temperature for rental units. Well, environmentalists are celebrating a landmark decision coming out of Montana tonight. A judge ruled in favor of 16 young people who sued the state, claiming it violated their rights to a healthy environment. International climate correspondent Susan Ormerston now on its impact and precedent. A win for climate justice and for Montana's youth. In a landmark trial, the state fought hard to suppress but couldn't. You know, it's really scary seeing what you care for disappear right in front of your eyes. The 16 youth argued Montana had shirked its constitutional obligation to protect and maintain a clean and healthful environment for them and future generations by refusing to assess the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. The judge agreed, saying youth are disproportionately harmed by fossil fuel pollution. Aged 5 to 22 years old, they won the first youth-led climate trial in the U.S. This case has given me hope, knowing that we're able to actually go testify. Our Children's Trust, their legal backer, called the decision a sweeping win, a game-changer in this generation's efforts to save the planet. What the case means is that the Montana government can no longer stick its head in the sand and ignore the climate impacts of the decisions it makes in regards to fossil fuel extraction. It's not clear how the ruling will impact government's legal obligations or how its message could spread beyond Montana's borders. This case will undoubtedly continue to inspire young people and climate activists all across Canada. 
Montana will likely appeal. The challengers say they're ready. I hope that as a young person, you know, we might actually have a chance to make a difference. And for my, for my life and for my kids' life, you know, not all hope may be lost. Susan, what's your sense of it? Could we expect more cases like this to go to trial? Yes. I mean, climate cases have doubled uh, over the last five years. I mean, with politics so unpredictable, elections come and go, people are trying to take these cases to court to get legal precedents, which may be more difficult to overturn. Of all the ones out there, any in particular to keep an eye on? Yes. Curiously, Hawaii. Youth there are taking Hawaii's Department of Transportation to court for violating their constitutional rights with all these emissions. And that case is going to trial next June. All right, we'll be watching. Susan, thank you. You're welcome. Now, in Michigan, two pilots escaped a plane crash just in the nick of time. All of it caught on video. The fighter jet was performing at an air show when suddenly an explosion and an urgent escape. Two pilots ejecting. This was just moments before the plane crashed into the parking lot of an apartment building. At first, I didn't know if this was something that was like part of the show. And then we saw the explosion. It was like, it's obviously not part of the show at all. So I, I'm just in disbelief. There was one sound where there was a, a boom. And then the next sound was a boom too. But then after the second one, the pilot came out. And then soon after, the plane just went down and it was a crash. The pilots were taken to hospital for minor injuries. And luckily, no one was at the parking lot at the time when the jet went down. Anger is growing tonight against the Ontario government's decision to open up protected land to housing developers. But Premier Doug Ford isn't backing down. Can anything make the government reverse course? Katie Nicholson looks at those pushing back. Good morning, everyone. Ontario's finance minister was supposed to trumpet the province's first quarter finances. There was a bias toward powerful developers. You're saying nobody cares about I that? Didn't say, I didn't say nobody cares. Instead, he ended up defending the Ford government's decision to reallocate protected Greenbelt land to developers, repeating a familiar message. It's an absolute crisis that we're in. We're in a housing crisis. Last week, the Auditor General's scathing report into the decision made 15 recommendations. The government struck a working group to implement all but one, which was to reevaluate its decision. Save the Greenbelt! Save the Greenbelt! The rallies, the protests that are happening, the municipalities that are speaking out, we need to, need to ramp all of that up. The provincial Green Party leader says it's all about public pressure, but he'd also like the federal government to step in and examine the impacts of developing the land. Which, by the way, is some of the best farmland in all of North America threatening endangered species, threatening the Rouge National Park. We need an environmental review from the federal government. Those who fought for decades to protect this land say legal experts are looking at every option to push back. They're at this moment figuring out what's the best legal strategy uh, over the next number of months to, to affect what we want to have done. And former Toronto Mayor David Crombie says Organizers are planning a September blitz with pro-Greenbelt ads, billboards and rallies. They're going to have a fight, that's for sure. And there are other pressures that could halt the development plan. The Ontario Provincial Police's anti-rackets branch still looking into the matter, as is the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. It launched an investigation earlier this year and is now mulling over a second investigation. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. There are growing concerns tonight about the safety of the deposed president of Niger. The leaders of a coup that ousted him from power last month now say he will be prosecuted for high treason. As Sasha Petrosik tells us, that threat has triggered international condemnation. In Niger's capital, supporters of the coup gathered a concert. A moment of apparent enthusiasm as the West African country struggles, not only with poverty and an Islamist insurgency, but an uncertain political leadership. It's best left to the military leaders who've taken power, says one supporter. Last month, soldiers ousted Niger's elected government and placed President Mohamed Bazoum under house arrest. 
Now they threaten to try him for high treason. In a video statement, a member of the junta said the deposed president has undermined the security of Niger by colluding with foreign leaders. On the streets, there doesn't seem to be much support for Bazoum, who's failed to turn around one of the world's poorest countries, despite vast uranium resources, international aid and Western military help. Bazoum is the one who committed the biggest betrayal, says this man. But much of the world's leadership condemns plans for a trial. It's obviously very, very worrying uh, declaration. We remain extremely concerned about uh, the state of being, uh, the health and safety of, uh, of the president and his family. Washington has more than a thousand troops who may now be forced to leave Niger, abandoning their fight against Islamist militants. It denounces the coup uh, and any trial. Uh, this action is uh, completely unwarranted and unjustified, and candidly, it will not contribute to a peaceful resolution of this crisis. All is not lost yet. As for Niger's neighbors, West Africa's regional bloc repeated calls for coup leaders to step down or else face outside military intervention, with forces on standby as a last resort. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Toronto. A new study is putting a spotlight on working out while pregnant. I plan to continue biking for as long as I fit on my bike and feel comfortable. The evidence that suggests you can turn up the heat. A photographer races to capture the last veterans of the Korean War. If you remember them, they're not gonna go. They're gonna live forever. And cracking the code on an old safe. It took me 10 hours because the lock was not cooperating properly. But what was inside? We're back in two. Look at that. Europe's most active volcano has roared back to life. This is the latest spectacular display by Mount Etna on the island of Sicily. The hot lava and ash caused major delays at a nearby international airport. Now, Etna has had many eruptions, but none of them have caused significant damage for centuries. There's new Canadian research that suggests that high-intensity exercise is safe during most pregnancies, but as Paige Parson shows us, that's at odds with current guidelines. Tara Manka is 27 weeks pregnant with twins. With her doctor's support, the Edmonton runner, cyclist, and cross-country skier is staying active. I'll continue with running and I might adapt to hiking up hills or possibly swimming or doing other activities. Current Canadian pregnancy guidelines recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week or about 21 minutes a day. The participants actually uh, came in first thing in the morning. But recent research from the University of Alberta tested the safety of high intensity exercise. In the area of exercise and pregnancy, there are a lot of long standing, um, often theoretical concerns. And so because of that, we've basically been prevented from actually testing these concerns to see if they're correct or incorrect. So this is where we do all of our research. The study included 15 pregnant women doing one minute spin bike sprints at greater than 90% maximum heart rate. Both the mother and the baby responded quite normally, uh, exactly as we would expect, and uh, tolerated the exercise very well. We didn't see any adverse effects. The small study won't change current guidelines, but it's still important, says this family doctor who focuses on maternal health. It's adding to a growing body of evidence that uh, actually high intensity uh, physical activity and exercise is safe. Forte says most pregnant people don't need a doctor's okay to continue exercising. But people with health issues or a complicated pregnancy should speak to their practitioner. For now, working out is helping Manka feel better prepared for giving birth. Being able to continue some activity and maintain some strength going into that feels like it gives me a bit more confidence. She'll keep moving as long as it feels safe and comfortable. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. 
Well, she's dubbed the hardest working royal, perhaps not tomorrow as she celebrates her birthday. On August the 15th, 1950, a daughter was born. Princess Anne sat down for an exclusive interview to talk about her brother's plans. It doesn't sound like a good idea from where I'm standing, I have to say. And her parents passing. When you see the photograph, it's much worse somehow. We revisit the headline-grabbing conversation. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Well, the British royal family is about to celebrate a birthday. Princess Anne is turning 73 years old tomorrow. As the only daughter of the late Queen Elizabeth, the Princess Royal has spent many of those years in the public eye. Most recently, ahead of the coronation of her brother, the now King Charles. That's when I sat down with the princess for an exclusive interview on the immense change within the royal family. Changes that have happened and the ones to come. This is St. James's Palace in London. And more than just look at it, let's go inside. This is the private sitting room for the Princess Royal Princess Anne. She has opened up the room and opened up her schedule to do something she rarely does, conduct an interview with us about things she doesn't often talk about, losing both her parents within the span of 18 months, the future of the monarchy and Canada. This is our conversation with Princess Anne. So I thank you very much for making time for us. I, I know you don't have much of it at all. Oh, only um, when I'm in London, I tend to sort of pack it in when I'm in London. There's a reason Princess Anne is referred to as the hardest working royal. In addition to being involved with more than 300 charities, she carries out more events than any other royal and carries with her that sense of responsibility passed on from her mother, the queen. On August the 15th, 1950, a daughter was born. The little princess was christened Anne Elizabeth Alice Louise. The second child and only daughter of the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. She had her first royal engagement at the age of 18 and started working with Save the Children shortly after. She still works with them. Princess Anne this afternoon at the equestrian events. She's an Olympian, competed in Montreal in 1976. She's a mother of two, and she spent her whole life under the watchful eyes of the world's cameras. Most recently, in September, when the Queen died, 72-year-old Princess Anne with her mother until the very end. So what will the world look like now for her and her brother, the King? But I think for my brother, you know, this is something he's been waiting for. And he's probably spent more time thinking about it. Um, for the rest of us, it's more a question of, OK, we have to shift the way we support. And that's, that's what we need to do. And what does that shift look like for you? Um, well, that's, that's... We don't know yet. Mm. I mean, there was, a, there was an order to the years, um, because my mother didn't change very much. We kind of knew what the rhythm of the year was. Mm -hmm. So that will, things like that will change. And how we are part of the support for the monarchy may change slightly. Who knows? And when you hear sometimes people refer to a slimmed down monarchy, I, I can't imagine what, what that might mean for a role like yours. I, I don't know how many more hours in the day you have <laughs> to take more things on. Well, I think the slimmed down was, was said in a day when there were a few more people around to <laughs> make that seem like a justifiable right. <laughs> comment. <laughs> The world um, changes a bit. It changes a bit. I mean, it doesn't sound like a good idea from where I'm standing, I have to say. I'm, sure it does I'm not, not quite sure what else, you know, we can do. A few more royals were indeed on the job not that long ago. Take Prince Andrew, Prince Harry and Meghan off the roster. In addition to the loss of the Queen and Prince Philip, what you'll end up seeing is a decidedly smaller contingent we wouldn't be having this conversation had you not, not that long ago, it's still very fresh, mm. lost your mother, the mm. queen. Um, this is something everyone in the world can understand, the, the private loss here. I think it doesn't matter how old you are when you lose a parent, you're still a child it, in that moment. Well, the relationship tends to remain, if you're lucky, yeah. remains very similar throughout your life, doesn't it? Yes. 
We have an impression from what we saw because of all the cameras. The cameras were often so fixed on you, so fixed on you, as you made that journey uh, behind the vehicle. Is it a blur? Uh, is it acute? Were you able to, to take any of it in? Uh, no, I think we took a lot of it in, partly because we knew the route. And I did actually spot people I knew on the way. It was such an impressive sight. And it was more than that because it was really touching in the way that people responded mm -hmm. and how they did things. And, you know, the people brought their ponies and horses out, but they not only brought them out, they platted them, they were properly dressed, they were well turned out. They brought their tractors out and they parked them, you know, tidily, they were all clean. And if you come from a rural background, hmm. I was really impressed. You know, it was just an <laughs> astonishing sight. But the sheer numbers of people have turned up in quite extraordinary places. You were never going to miss, miss that uh, and the atmosphere that it created. Leaving Balmoral was never easy, mm. but then it never has been. <laughs> and I was just as bad when I was leaving as a child. What, what why? Well, because I didn't, didn't like leaving. <laughs> a place associated with rest and relaxation. Really, these are thoughts hardly associated with the late monarch or Princess Anne, who is on track again to be considered the hardest working royal this year. She's always been busy, a mixture of desire and duty. So COVID must have been a terrible block for that mm. kind of work. A, a block certainly from, uh, well, from everybody's perspective, mm -hmm. but it was intriguing to note how people, there was the word they kept using here, pivoted. So they pivoted using either the strengths of what they did before to deliver it slightly differently. We sometimes at home talk about COVID as a thief uh, mm. in that yes. it stole from a lot of people. Did it, it, did. It, did it steal from you? Um, in some respects. Um, I suppose I, th I tend to think it, it stole a bit from my father, who you know, lost a, a lot of the people who would have gone to see him and talk mm. to him and you know, have those conversations that kept him interested. And he lost, he lost all of that. I'm sure there are lots of families who will tell you the same thing, that the, for the older generation, losing those contacts, those, the ability to, you know, online didn't do it for everybody. No. I mean, I'm sorry to bring it up, but I think of that, that image of, of your mother, the queen, by herself. Yes, in that funeral. moment. Yeah. That, that was a thief. Yeah. yeah, you're quite right. And then, in some ways, I'm glad we didn't see that at that moment. I and mean, then when you see the photograph, it's much worse somehow. And you saw more of that than we did, uh, accompanying the coffin. It was the COVID restrictions that imposed that solitary grief on the Queen in April of 2021 at the funeral of her husband of seven decades, Prince Philip. His death seemed to begin a chain of momentous royal events, all within 18 months. Some wrenching lows for the family, but also a moment unlike any other in British history, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The feeling was extraordinary. It was loud, it was raucous. But in the crowd, you kept hearing people saying, thank you, ma'am, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes. And I, I wondered then, did your mother, the queen, know that they were saying thank you? Did she, did she feel that gratitude? Um, I suspect she would have, she would have noticed. Did she have fun through the Pine uh, Fun, yes. I think it's quite a long weekend for that yes. to be down as fun. But I think when she came at the end, I think that she realized that everybody had appreciated it. That really made a difference. But that, as it were, was then. This almost seems like another era. It's a moment when feelings about the monarchy are hardening. And don't think the members of the royal family don't notice. When we come back. You don't sound worried about the health or the longevity of the monarchy. Um, it, I think you're putting words into my mouth, as they say.
fairy tale story of kings and princesses, there are facts, hard ones, including the reality that the global relationship with the British royal family is frankly shifting. There are countries all over this planet that want to sever their ties with the British royal family. They do not want the monarch as head of state. This is not something the royal family is oblivious to. Polls suggest young people in particular are cooling. 60% of Canadians, regardless of their age, suggesting they don't support Charles as king. Because we're in this moment of transition, I think it's it's not unnatural that people are having conversations about the monarchy and the place of the monarchy uh, in, in various countries, Canada included. And, and some of the recent polling is, is suggesting that there is a drop in, in the percentage of people who would like to see the monarchy continue. How do you, how do you deal with that as a family? Well, we don't, um, in many respects, need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> not least of all, because um, it is the monarch that is the, the key to this, and the constitution um, that underpins the monarchy. We as a family see ourselves there as to support that role. What we do, we hope, contributes um, to the monarchy and the way in which it can convey continuity uh, of not just interest, but of service, of understanding, uh, the way that people and communities um, want to live their lives. And I think so often we get the chance to see communities and, and the people who do things really well and are very generous with their time um, in a way that, if you look at the media, you tend not to get that impression. <laughs> are there conversations about relevance? There will be everywhere. It's not a conversation that I would necessarily have. I think it's in, it, it perfectly true that it, it is a moment where you need to have that discussion. But I would just underline the, that the monarchy provides with the constitution a degree of long-term uh, stability that is actually quite hard to come by any other way. Hmm. And, and when we think about this, t this duty, this role that the king has taken on, what kind of king do you think he'll be? <laughs> well, you know what you're getting, because he's been <laughs> practicing for a bit. <laughs> and I don't think he'll change. You know, he is committed to his, his own level of service. That will remain true. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Tangibly, though, what will he do? What steps will be taken? I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many, as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. There are some indications he is conscious of the wrongs in ways the royal family haven't seemed to express before. The king making a move after weeks of searing coverage in the UK about the monarchy's ties to slavery. Hardly a new subject, but the response from the palace was new. Buckingham Palace says it's cooperating with an independent study into the links between the British monarchy and the slave trade in the 17th and 18th centuries. He did something interesting uh, not long ago, offering tacit support to the research into the ties of slavery to the monarchy. <laughs> he just op he, he said, absolutely, have a look. Well, you know more than I do, because I rather suspect that was the media's interpretation of that mm. particular deal. What's your who sense knows of it? Who came up with that idea? Do you, do, is there a different sense? Do you have uh, it's not really a subject of conversation that I would even go down. Um, a historical perspective, which is slightly different, um, maybe more realistic. And, and which is? No, the historical perspective, it just goes back a lot further. Mm -hmm. And the modern contexts are very different. Slavery hasn't gone away. Mm -hmm. No, come on. Mm -hmm. Don't be too focused on time scales and periods. History isn't like that. Recognizing the British monarchy's place in colonization in slavery will be one thing for the institution. Acting on it, finding a new path forward, this would take generations of work. Is change, is reconciliation coming? 
Is the coronation genuinely the start of a different relationship? You don't sound worried about the health or the longevity of the monarchy. Um, I think you're putting words into my mouth, as they say. Are you then? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Would you say that you are or you aren't, though? I'm, I, I am no, I wouldn't. Okay. I mean, I just, I, because I believe that there is a genuine benefit from this particular arrangement, um, the constitutional monarchy, and I think it has good long-term benefits, and that commitment to long-term is what the monarchy stands for. Your Highness, thank you so much oh, for your time. Oh, well, Genuinely come appreciate on, it. Wait. Earlier in that interview, we mentioned that Princess Anne is known as the hardest working royal. She has been keeping up with that reputation with uh, two visits to Canada, for example, over the course of just one month this year. The question now, when her brother, King Charles, is coming. Next, an online challenge unlocks a mystery. It took me 10 hours. I turned that handle as fast as I could. The Winnipeg man who cracks the code in our moment. A Korean photographer's mission has brought him here to Canada. He is traveling the world taking portraits of veterans of the Korean War. Philip Lee Shanok shows us how those images are capturing stories of sacrifice and service. In war, Romeo Daly was just out of his teens when he signed up, and he says he wasn't prepared for what he saw. When people would ask me what it was like, I would say, I've been to hell and back. In 1950, thousands of North Korean soldiers aided by the Chinese People's Liberation Army pushed south and almost took the entire Korean peninsula. Soldiers from Canada, the United States and 16 other countries fought to push them back roughly to where the border between North and South stands today. Okay, here we go. South Korean photographer Rami Hyun is traveling the world to take portraits of surviving Korean War vets. While he admits it brings back painful memories, Daly agreed to be part of Project Soldier. Korea has been the forgotten war for so many years. Do you know that it was in the late 80s, 90s, before the United States admitted that it was a war? And do you know that before that, Canada gave the Korea War veterans absolutely nothing? It's not a forgotten war. It's a forgotten victory. It's been a labor of love for almost a decade. Hyun began on his own, but now has a team. He covers all his own expenses and volunteers his time. He says he wants to honor their service. I realize the freedom, not, freedom is not free, and so my sacrifice paid for that. So far, he has portraits and documented stories from more than 2,700 veterans. But he says it's a race against time. Daly is one of his youngest subjects, and he's 91. We want to say to them, thank you for your service and sacrifice. If you remember them, they're not going to go. They're going to live forever. And he wants them to be remembered one portrait at a time. OK, sir, thank you for your service. Philip e. Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. Well, this photo, not nearly as special, but it is one that grabbed our attention. You're looking at a safe believed to be from the 1920s. The picture was posted online by a Baltimore bookstore with an invitation to come and crack that safe. But there were a few rules. So one, uh, no drilling. Two, only do this during store hours. And three, the bookstore would split the contents unless they were gross or cursed. So who cracked the code? A Winnipeg bus driver, of course. The man with the combination is our moment. Here you go. I'm part of a safe cracking slash lock picking uh, group, but now I'm just as it for hobbies. And uh, as a joke, one of these guys who saw the ad on Facebook or Twitter had sent it to me and said, hey, you should go and give this a try. But it only took four days to get the funds together. So uh, then I had to go and do it. Rick Amazini has come down all the way from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Apparently a couple of dozen people have given it a try. It took me 10 hours because the lock was not cooperating properly. So when it finally did what it was supposed to do, it was a big relief and I turned that handle as fast as I could. 
I couldn't have done it without the help of the group that I'm part of. So it's really a group effort. The only thing that was of interest, it was a pay stub from 1924. This whole experience taught me if you just have to put yourself out there and do something that's totally crazy, like fly to Baltimore and try to open a safe and then it just might work out for you. Just a pay stub for $5. That's it. Uh, Rick says a big shout out to the folks of lockpicking101.com who helped him when things got hairy. That is a national for August the 14th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.